Um, but I'd like to introduce our next speaker. He's actually been to, I think, nearly all of our nerd nights at this point. And, um, I've missed a few. You've missed a few, so you're dead to me. <laughs> right on. Um, but Trevor Prentice was uh, once the staff scientist at the TELUS World of Science, and now he works for a little organization that's making pretty amazing things happen. Pretty amazing things happen. Four beers. Uh, in the city of Edmonton, in Tech Edmonton. He's going to play with a lot of business, and if you haven't done the thing back there with the, the flippy thing, then you're also dead to me. Um, but he's going to give away fabulous prizes, and he's going to pay tribute to Nikola Tesla. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Trevor Prentice. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to just comment briefly on those last two. I, you know, um, I thought I was gonna. Oh, I was a little worried even about maybe having too many sort of sexual references. Um, <laughs> but I, I probably won't end up putting my hand in anything. So <laughs> I think I should be fine on that front. Um, and I, I mean, I've been to a few nerd light nights, like Adam mentioned, and. I just got to give these guys credit for coming up with such, sometimes especially, such obscure nerdiness. Um, I, had, I hardly even knew furries existed before this nerd night, and now like, look at all this awesome stuff. So, Chaos! Yes! Woo! Adam and Wade, thank you guys for putting this all together. It's totally awesome. Um, so anyway, as you can see here, tonight I'm going to be talking about encouraging public nerdgasms. Um, so does anyone know what a nerdgasm is? No, okay, all right, well. <laughs> um, it's kind of, well, as you can probably guess, it's kind of like an orgasm, um, but instead of being really sexual, it's really nerdy. So does that kind of make sense? You basically just get really excited about something that's kind of nerdy, um, so I'm sure many of you have had one of these before. Um, and as you can see there on the bottom, uh, my name is Trevor Prentice. All right, so let's start here. Um, so who wants more nerds in the world? Good, all right, I agree. Um, I think pretty much more nerds uh, means a better world. The more and more nerds we have, the better the world is gonna be. Um, so as awesome and great as kind of the societal level of science is, I think science is also really important on a personal level. Um, because the more we use science to make logical, kind of evidence-based decisions, the better decisions we're going to be making, the better the world's going to be, the better we're going to be, um, and the more nerdy we're going to be. So I think that's why, you know, the more nerds, the better the world. Um, so how are we going to go about getting more nerds? Uh, well, one thing comes to mind right away. <laughs> Just grow them in your home. I mean, how hard can it be, right? Just make them, that's what we do as humans. Uh, but upon a little bit more in-depth reflection on this, uh, I kind of thought about probably the non-nerdy are procreating more than we are. So, I don't know, anyway. It, it, not to say we shouldn't use this method, but we should use as many methods as we can think of. Uh, so, a lot of science is really hard, kind of uh, individual, you gotta do a lot of reading sometimes, research, that type of thing. Um, and so, Especially at the Science Center, which you might start to realize that's probably what I'm going to be talking about. Um, it's tricky to teach people a lot of really in-depth science when you have like 10 seconds with a child before he runs off and plays with the next exhibit. Uh, so I find that a lot of times inspiring people to develop the motivation to want to learn more about science and become more nerdy in general um, is a, a, sometimes a better technique than just... Um, then, you know, trying to just cram like two textbooks into their head in five minutes or something. Uh, so really what we need to be doing is having and encouraging more public nerdgasms. Uh, so, I worked at TELUS World of Science Edmonton for uh, somewhere around 2.71 years as staff scientist, uh, a little bit more before that as well as a different position. And uh, these are some of my favorite techniques for um, nerding out, basically. And I'm going to be talking about discussing some of these techniques this evening. So, uh, did anyone see this? Yeah. Uh, in the sky. So this is a huge fireball, and it was visible from Edmonton back in 2008. I'm glad some of you guys saw it. The rest of you sucks to be you. Um, but no, I'm kidding because actually I didn't see it either. I was inside the planetarium looking at the fake sky when this was happening in the real sky, and that planetarium's good. 
but it doesn't uh, do quite the real-time, unpredictable type meteor. So this is a meteor, a rock falling from outer space, um, and it happens all the time, actually. Oh no, I forgot my... No, I didn't get Here it is. All right, and this is a piece of that image that you're seeing right there, that video. This is a piece of the actual meteor that's in that video. So for those of you who saw that meteor fall in 2008, this is it. Uh, or at least a small piece of it. Uh, so my boss back in the t back in 2008 went out. He searched for like a week and, and found this tiny piece. Uh, and it's pretty cool. We let kids come up and play with it and do some tests on it with magnets and those types of things. So if you want to come and see what this is like, give it a feel. Uh, feel free to do that after the talk. I warn you though, uh, I have seen many highly intense nerdgasms result from this tactile experience. So be careful. Be careful if you decide to do that. Um, what else? This one here, this is probably my favorite exhibit in the TELUS world of science, and it goes unnoticed, unfortunately, uh, quite often. It's a little small. Any idea what this is? It is a space rock, and I heard a couple people over here say it's the moon. So this is a rock that, comes, that came straight from the moon. Um, it's a piece of the moon that the Apollo astronauts brought back, and yes, it's a space rock. So uh, this one, you're not actually allowed to touch it, but who cares, it's part of the freaking moon. <laughs> Alright, who knows who this guy is? Good, good. I had a whole line uh, planned out here where, and you call yourself nerds. Um, if you, just in case you said no, but of course you know who that is. And I believe he's in town tonight, actually. This is Chris Hadfield at the time um, of this video, which I'll play in a second. He was commander of the International Space Station, and he's a Canadian, the first Canadian commander, so yeah! pretty awesome guy. Uh, is he here tonight? In the room? <laughs> no, okay. He was... Bare Naked Ladies! Yeah, I know, he's singing with the Bare Naked Ladies, but I thought that was done at 10, and it's almost 10, so I don't know where he is. Anyway, um, where am I on my... Yes, okay, so the awesome thing about this is we had an HD video conference with him while he was in space at Telescope Science. Doesn't sound like you guys believe me, let me prove it. Do we have audio? Houston International Space Station, yes, ready for the event. TELUS World of Science, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Frank Boring from the TELUS World of That's Science. That's my boss. How do you hear me? There's a bit of a delay in space. Frank and the <laughs> TELUS World of Science and everybody in Edmonton, hello. This is Chris Hanfield from the International Space Station. Yeah. Woo so that's totally a call out to you guys, um, everyone in Edmonton, he said it right there. So, so the cool thing about working at the Science Center is uh, we're kind of like a local hub for science, right? And we have a lot of times, uh, like the CSA and NASA know about science centers and they, uh, so we have an easier time booking types of people like this, famous nerds, if you can, I put that in quotes there because, I mean, they're nerds still, so most people really don't know about them, but nerds do. Um, so it's, we have an easier time booking them and we can bring in a whole bunch of schools and uh, have them all watch this video conference. We had kids just asking Chris Hadfield questions for like 20 minutes, um, which is pretty awesome. So I, I've got another story, but I don't have time to tell you, so ask me a question about it and I'll, I'll tell you after. Um, so on certain occasions when we couldn't get anyone actually famous, uh, I got to be a little bit famous myself. So here you can see me being interviewed by Global. Uh, anytime there's some big science story, Global News, or some local, local news agency tries to uh, put a local spin on it, like, look, this is kind of happening in Edmonton. Uh, and, uh, but actually sometimes there really are good science things happening in Edmonton as well. Um, so this is me talking a little bit about how Chris Hadfield is famous now, awesome. Uh, and you might have seen, uh, did anyone see at any point a uh, handsome knight in shining chainmail, maybe uh, <laughs> gracing your presence in the evening you know, with some scintillating science factoids? Well, that was me. Uh, <laughs> I actually still meet people who uh, say, wait, was that you? That was, were you that knight on that commercial? So we did a few commercials for some of our exhibits. Um, this one was uh, for the Narnia exhibit, and there's one that I couldn't resist Thank not you. showing you. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I'll, we'll move on from that pretty quickly, I think. Um, <laughs> So who hasn't seen the moon through a telescope? Raise your hand. Oh, oh good, good, very few. All right, I'm happy about that. Um, but even those of you who have, uh, 
we've got an observatory at Telescope of Science, Edmonton, and the moon is unbelievably awesome when you see it through a telescope, as I'm glad to see many of you know. Uh, those of you who haven't, those few of you who put up your hands, make sure to come to the Telescope of Science Observatory tomorrow. Um, as long as it's not too cloudy, because pretty much this is unbelievable. This picture does not do it justice in any way. Uh, this and the next picture I took through a couple of the telescopes at the Telescope of Science, uh, but I'm not that good at it yet. And well, this one turned out pretty good, but I was taking them kind of during the day, which makes it not quite as good to see either. So this one here is, you can probably guess what that is. A little bit, a little bit trickier to see. So the real thing, especially if you get it at a time when it's nighttime and the sky is actually clear, um, then you're gonna see an awesome view. So the moon's probably my favorite thing to look at through a telescope. Saturn is second best, um, and a close second at that. So uh, make sure you check it out. It's free of charge. A lot of people think maybe you need general admission or something to get into the observatory, but no, it's free of charge. And uh, hopefully I will improve on these shots because although I'm not staff scientist anymore at Telus World of Science, I am volunteer observatory attendant. <laughs> so I'll be there uh, tomorrow, like I said, as long as it's not cloudy and I'll be uh, showing off some of the things in the sky. Um, okay, so this is one of my favorite things that I was working on at the Telus World of Science. And as you can tell from the top here, it's all about math. Uh, we had a yearly math festival that um, it sort of started with this idea called a snap math fair. And uh, it's, I guess it, you can kind of think of it like a science fair, but better in every single possible way. Um, <laughs> and it, uh, two professors at the University of Alberta sort of cre came up with this idea of the snap math fair. Uh, one of which, Andy Liu, uh, helped us get started for the first couple of years and set things up. Um, and then the math fest basically just grew from there. So we ended up having sort of a crazy amount of different activities that we could do. And for this next little bit, uh, actually in a second, uh, make sure to study this slide because you might be tested on it in a minute. Um, but the other thing that the other things that we use it during our math fest are in the back of the room there. So that shut the box game. Who got a chance to play that? Good. A few of you. Good. Uh, and of course, spirographs. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, we'll. This one is kind of a fun logic game, so I'll need some volunteers for it. Anyone uh, brave volunteers? Yes, right there. Really? Um, who else? Wow, you guys are not very brave. Is he? All right, we got uh, someone right close to the front here. All right, come on up. Good. Um, what on earth did I do with this stuff? Oh my god, it's in the back. Okay, I'll, re I'll be right back. What do you mean? What do you mean? Oh, you don't get it. Okay, okay. you guys are never fun. <laughs> I got bottles. Do not be alarmed. Sorry about that. Wade really wanted me to jump off the stage tonight, so I guess maybe that'll count. Uh, okay, so the, the thing you have to do right now is become detached from each other. This knot is not supposed to be there, but it won't cause any problems. Uh, without taking these off your wrists and without undoing the knots. Okay? I'll give you like 10 slides. Go! <laughs> Alright, so that's a good fun logic uh, puzzle. And uh, we had different types of games in the thing. You can probably recognize this as a giant version of Mastermind there. <laughs> Chocolate Fix. Has anyone heard of Chocolate Fix? It's a good, good uh, logic game. Rush Hour, you probably know that one in the back. Uh, this is kind of a game I half invented. Uh, called, it's a big jumping game. Uh, we did different kind of math crafts. You can make these fractal cards here, which are super cool and mathy. Um, a flexagon, I've got one in my pocket. I forgot to show you guys all that, but after the show, come up and check out my flexagon. Actually, <laughs> making progress? So this flexagon, you can see it's yellow, right, on the back, it's red. Uh, you flex it just a little bit, now it's yellow, a little different, and blue. Crazy, eh? So there's been a lot of people who've studied that mathematically, surprisingly enough. Um, this is an octahedral balloon animal. Pretty cool, we made some of those for the kids. Uh, domino portraits, so you can kind of, it's an interesting mathematical problem trying to figure out how to make a portrait uh, out of dominoes. This is a computer program called the Conway's Game of Life, where it simulates this. Uh, another cool one. Sorry, I can't go into these in a lot of detail, but <laughs> ask me lots of questions. Um, and another kind of a math 
game. How are you guys doing over here? Worse off now than? Yeah, okay. Getting better. Okay, keep at it then a little bit more. I'll give you a few more slides. Um, in addition to our yearly math fests, we had yearly Pi Day festivals as well. So, Pi Day is on March 14th. Alright, I think I better just show these, show these guys or help them out a little bit here. Pull, just pull. They did it! They did it! It was totally them! Alright, so the, the, the logic, the answer, well, you guys might want to try it after this, after this. Yeah, give it a try. I'll show you, I'll show you at the end. Uh, think about it a little more. Alright, fine, I'll show you Watch this. Tough audience. So, um, you can loop it around the person's wrist. And now, I don't really know how to do it in reverse though, do I? <laughs> All I said you couldn't do is take these off your wrists and untie the knots here. Let's stick it through again. So if we take one of these, loop it through the loop, around the wrist, and then you pull. See, it didn't break any of the rules. Did it? <laughs> All right, so you guys can take. Thank you very much for volunteering. Um, very, very brave of you. Alright, so Pi Day. Uh, hopefully everyone out here celebrates Pi Day on March 14th. 3.14, as they say. Um, and uh, it usually ended up in the staff, all of us who were working on Pi Day, enjoying some very tasty two pie radian pies. Uh, we had crafts there, so we used the, the um, Spirographs more than Pi Day because it's a little bit more of a circular thing. You can see all the pie related functions in there. Um, we made a big pie chain with all the digits of pie in it. We made pie bracelets. You can represent pi using beads of different colors and things. Oh, there's so many ways you can do it. Um, other types of games where you run around, jump around, and this is a life-size um, hyperboloid. So you can get inside it and create a hyperboloid. A game of Twister, math style. Can't miss out on that. Okay, this is one of my favorites. I kind of, uh, I don't know, came up with, or I guess I didn't come up with this, of course. I made it glow sticky. Um, <laughs> so this is a variation of the Buffon's needle problem. And basically, the cool thing is if you throw these glow sticks, um, randomly, as randomly as you can, the probability that they will land on one of these lines is equal to one divided by pi, the theoretical pro probability. Mm. Isn't that insane? Yeah. So I had like um, this many kids throw glow sticks, <laughs> and then I counted how many uh, that landed on a line and how many were total thrown, and I divided the two, and we got an experimental value of pi for about one over three, which it's really not that great. I was realizing there's some biases in their throw. They weren't completely random, so. Um, and of course, another celebration of 3.14 there. Some nerds. Okay, demo stage, jeez. Um, the great thing about the demo stage at the Telescope of Science is that most of it is fireproof. So you can, you can do some really cool things on the demo stage. Um, here you can, now this isn't a demo that we do very often, but you can, uh, get a good idea of the types of things that we like to do on there and the types of things that are possible. So here we're hooking a Tesla coil up to a pumpkin. Um, and then inside that pumpkin, you can see Frank and I uh, putting a special chemical that creates, uh, when, when you pour water on it, creates a poisonous explosive gas. <laughs> and then we turn on the pet Tesla coil and it explodes under, uh, expectedly, which, you know, pretty standard type of stuff. Uh, but pretty awesome nonetheless. And so this is an area where, especially compared to schools and other educational facilities, we have, uh, we seem to have more supplies, easier access to the supplies and the tools like Tesla coils um, and pumpkins <laughs> that make it easier for us to do these kinds of things. So if a school wants to come on a field trip and watch our demo, here it is in slow-mo. It was pretty awesome. <laughs> and then they don't have to basically buy the Tesla coil and the calcium carbide and all that stuff themselves. They can just come on a field trip and we'll do some awesome demos for them. So it, uh, it's kind of a good educational model in those ways. Um, oh yes, now for my next bit I'll need some more volunteers. Um, maybe even braver than the last. And more of you. Anyone? 
I'm totally brave. All right, come on. Yes. Uh, I'll give you some info about it. We're going to be using this back here. Probably some of you can't see it, so I'm going to move things around a little bit. We're going to use this Tesla coil. And I understand some of you might have seen a Tesla coil at the previous Nerd Night. Um, so we're going to do uh, some type of similar thing to last time. Look at this. But we're going to try and build on that a little bit. So, yeah, awesome, good. People coming up, that's what I want. Actually, that should be enough, I think. That should be good. Trevor, yep. should they remove electronic devices? Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, <laughs> so, this is a Tesla coil invented by Nikola Tesla. It creates some awesome electricity and static electricity and kind of shoots it out. So, I don't have too much to go into the scientific details, but uh, metal should be okay. It's just if you have, like, a, a phone in your pocket or something. Um, it's electronic things that sometimes can be affected by Tesla calls. Actually, the, the important question is, does anyone up here have a pacemaker? Anyone in the room? Pacemaker? No. Good. Okay. Let's continue with the demo then. Alright, alright. So, if I can have you all line up along the stage in that direction, um, and I will give one of you this very fancy fluorescent light of science. And I'll give that to the person at the end. Now, this is a bit of a long line. You guys sort of came up. Uh, I think it'll be fine, especially at the end. I'm wearing mine. I'm going to be at this end. Uh, yes, here's my keys. Um, so I'm going to turn the Tesla coil on, and we're going to become a human uh, light fixture. Sound good? <laughs> All right, so we can have the lights dimmed a little bit. Well, <laughs> I don't like to plug it in until I'm ready to go. Okay, so good. okay, and we all have to hold hands. Hold hands. All right, are you guys ready? All right, and you don't have to hold that at the end. You can hold it anywhere you want. All right, here we go. And it's pretty awesome you just turning it on. Maybe one more, a little lower with the lights. You can. Yeah, that's a good description of it, I think. Very shocking. <laughs> um, so, and you can see some of the other things I do in that, in that Arcs and Sparks demo you were seeing sort of behind me. Um, so to close things off, uh, this is probably my favorite place Sophie. in the telescope of science. Yeah, that's Sophie. Um, the first ever Zeiss Mark IV Cosmorama Planetarium Projector in the world. Oh. Now, it's the first ever Mark IV, so there were other Zeiss, you know, Mark III planet, but who cares? Mark IV is where it's at. And this was uh, installed in 1984. Uh, I don't personally recall that, but that's what they say, so I'm sure it's true. Um, and what I do personally recall is unjamming an unbelievably ridiculous number of old school slide projectors uh, in the dark, mid show in 2008 when we were still using this system. So it definitely had its longevity. And um, there's some pros and cons to the old Zeiss uh, star projectors. Uh, the biggest pro I think is just how awesome the optics look. So when you have stars projecting through all those little holes there onto the dome, which is basically like the sky, uh, they look very realistic, pinpoint stars, and you can make them as bright as you, well, brighter or dimmer, just uh, as pinpoints. Um, Here's a, here's a few more diagrams of the Zeiss. You can see how awesome and old school it is. Uh, so when Adam, or sorry, when Wade sent out the official like speaker nerd night email, he said, "I will provide the stage. We'll provide the audience uh, booze and any audio visual equipment you might need." So of course, I mean, I I recommend it. All right, ask. Uh, could you provide me with a 14 meter uh, hemispherical dome, uh, six full dome digital video projectors, and the, the 16 computer digital sky system to run the whole thing? Diva! So, what? It's not, what, I thought, it's, no, it's not in the back or anything? I said yes. So. He did say yes, so, I don't know, I thought it was, anyway. Okay, I don't see it here, so obviously the, I mean, and actually I fully agree with you, the booze and the chandeliers were uh, the higher priority. So, round of applause to the Citadel for these chandeliers. Pretty awesome.
So instead of my full, full realistic, awesome full dome show, I'll show you kind of a clip, a, a snippet. Uh, this video is that I'm going to show you in a second is uh, kind of a cropped, flat, uh, ver time lapse version of the full dome digital show. So you're just seeing a very small part of the sky. Um, and so I'll tell you, this is with the new system. So we're not using Sophie anymore, the old size. Uh, projector. It's kind of a newer system. It's fully digital. Um, it's not in the middle, unfortunately. It doesn't look as cool. It's not like this awesome robot that comes up in the middle glowing purple. Um, but you can do some awesome things with it. So it's uh, it got a lot more capability. It's fully scriptable, so any of the things you want to do, you could write a script to do it and then work on your show and improve your show that way. It's customizable, so when we find new comets or asteroids in the sky, we can add them into the system, um, or a TIE fighter even. <laughs> We added that for our Star Wars exhibit, uh, for the opening and different things. Uh, and as you'll see here in a minute, well, you can fly, you can virtually fly to the edge of the universe and all the way back and give people a really awesome sense of scale of the universe. Here I, I take off the Earth. Uh, this is a much faster version of my show than I usually do, do live. <laughs> so, and, I mean, part of the reason I really love the Margaret Ziegler Theater and the whole Science Center, but especially the Margaret Ziegler Theater is just uh, some of the questions and, and conversations I've had after doing a full dome uh, digital universe show have just blown my mind over and over again. Uh, it just really gets people thinking about what's, what's at the edge of the universe? How big is the universe? Uh, what's beyond the edge if there is anything? And people of any age, like I've had three year olds be like, oh, what's outside the edge of the universe? Well, that's a pretty tricky question that we have to work a little bit more. But you will become the person who answers that question, hopefully. Um, and uh, even things like uh, parallel universes, black holes, God, all sorts of awesome questions and conversations. Uh, so it's pretty obvious that watching a show like this, a digital universe show, makes even the most... Um, an, um, the least excited person to be in the audience, maybe it's they come with a field trip with their school, they just don't want to be there. It makes even that person just at least a little bit nerdier. Um, and so I love that about this show. And hopefully I've been able to make you guys a little bit nerdier this evening as well. And so thank you very much for listening and have a great evening. We have time for a few questions. No? Nobody? That guy. What did the full shirt say? This guy, this guy with like an eye as his body type? He's a furry. He's an eye. Furry. Uh, he says, be rational to this other guy who's like in a pie shape who says, get real. <laughs> Team math in the back over there. Any other questions for Trevor? Right here. Uh, Buzzard Cooley. So it landed near the Alberta Saskatchewan border. Uh, I guess there's a town there called Buzzard Cooley, or maybe two towns. One called Buzzard. Yeah. <laughs> so who's who's thinking about the joke? Is that a meteorite in your pocket? <laughs> uh, so only about ten percent of you. Far out. Or am I just having a nerve Yeah, you might be. Oh yeah, so that day we had that uh, HD video conference with Chris Hadfield. I wasn't feeling that well that day, but of course I had to go in. Um, and he talked a little bit about being sick in space, which was nice. I kind of connected with him on that. And then for some reason, that same day, there was another uh, chat with Chris Hadfield at a school. And so I was helping out a little bit with that. So I, as soon as we were done talking with him in the awesome HD, super awesome quality video, I ran over to the school. And this teacher who had set it up was working so hard. like he. Worked so hard to get NASA to even talk to him and to like um, set up the contact, and the it went okay, and the kids really loved it. But they were using kind of a different method to connect with Chris. They had a radio antenna that was trying to chase the space station at like 26,000 kilometers per hour across the sky, um, and it's all obviously computerized so that it can actually find it. Um, so the quality was just not quite as good. There was obviously no video, and it was very very uh, bad quality, a lot of static. Um, and to make matters worse, the radio tower wasn't even at the school. It was in Italy. So they had to have like a telephone conference call just to get this. So, I mean, it was, it just kind of made an impression on me as to, as a science center, we really have it, a, a much better opportunity to connect with these types of people. And that way we can bring in a lot more schools as well. It's not like one teacher working super hard to get this terrible connection with the ISS. So, 
I kind of made that impression. So one of the reasons I like the Science Center model, in addition to the, the school system, but. Uh, when is the observatory open at the, at the Science Center? Uh, right now, now that it's kind of getting into winter, we're open Friday, well, weekends, uh, Friday, Saturday nights, and Sundays during the day, and Saturdays during the day. Um, in the summer, it's every single day and night, so that's really the best time. It's a little warmer then, and it's weather dependent as well. So try to come on a Friday or a Saturday night, but as long as it's not super cloudy and super, or super cold. A uh, couple more questions at the back there. So Trevor, over the last week, has actually been tweeting at Chris Hadfield, inviting him to come here when he was done speaking at the E-Town conference. He's at the Weston. He's not here, so, like many of you, dead to me. <laughs> oh, I remember what I was going to say. And Chris Hadfield is the science educator that all us science educators aspire to be. Him and like Bill Nye, the science guy, obviously. What was your, uh, do you remember your first nerdgasm? Oh, jeez. Yeah, a little bit, but... So, I mean, at least being my type of nerd, I don't have the greatest memory. Uh, I've been trying to log more things lately, but back when I had my first nerdgasm, I can't, I probably can't remember. I remember a lot of stuff. I went to a school called Malmo Elementary School, and back in probably 1990, 90, yeah, 90, uh, we all had computers on our desks in grade three. Yeah, so I probably, I mean, I would go into class and I would just nerdgasm all day. <laughs> I didn't really learn how to handwrite, I just learned how to, I could type like 150 words per minute in grade four, and then it's just been coming down ever since. <laughs> Gross. All over it's the place. Plastic. Just wonder, like, what those computers on your desk did, other than nothing. No rushers. <laughs> or just Oregon Trail. <laughs> Trevor has died of dysentery more than any of you. <laughs> Trevor Prentice, thank you so much for joining us. I have to unplug this thing. Uh, we were worried that it would kill people. <laughs>